Uh, welcome everybody who's joined. Uh, this is the October edition of the Q Community Call. Um, as usual, we're going to start with a few project updates. Um, all those points listed there, and as we listed in the, the GitHub discussion as well. Um, please feel free to sort of jump in with questions along the way, but we will have a dedicated Q and A session at the end if it sort of makes sense to gather question, your question to the end. Um, well, hopefully, sort of keep the updates as short as possible, leaving as much time open for Q and A as possible. Um, a, aiming for sort of 30 minutes. Um, for those joining us on the recording, welcome. Uh, so going straight into the project updates, handing over to Marcel for a discussion around release updates. Yes. Um, so here's a slide that's uh, uh, pretty much the same as last time. There's a slightly different uh, focus, though. Um, because we've now uh, come along further with uh, V0.7, um, we can see that that sort of the the new new evaluator like the rewrite uh, indeed helps uh, to develop things uh, a bit quicker um so what we want to do uh, so the biggest remaining thing is this junction so what we want to do is to see if we can get a 0 0.7 out um as, as quickly as possible uh, so that we can avoid the 0 0.6 uh, step and then basically uh, maybe sacrificing some of the, the performance gains uh, that you would have gained for 0 0.7. Well, of course, you know, then 7.1 could, could do these performance gains, but I'll get to that in the next slide. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, so, so far everything but uh, this junctions is implemented. Um, not everything passes yet, but uh, the diagram you see here on the right is uh, like which of the test files uh, or, or what percentage of the test file passes. So 33% of the test files include this junction. So they're uh, excluded right now from the new implementation uh, in the test. 41% uh, fully passes, 14% is equivalent, which means um, you know, there might be some reordering, there might be um, some error messages that are slightly different, uh, some position information that's different. So that's really what equivalent means. Um, there's also some tests that change, but are actually improved. So there, there are bug fixes. And then 10% of them um, have bugs of the files have bugs remaining. So to be a little bit more concrete, that's about 35 uh, test files. Um, however, from the errors that I get from the discrepancies that I get, I can see that uh, many, many of these uh, errors are actually the same. So I really think there's you know, it's, it's very hard to say, but but uh, probably half half of that is uh, duplicate errors. A moment, of course, I'm getting calls during the presentation. Um, yep, and um, yeah. So the idea is that with this junction, so there's uh, th with the new implementation, it's quite hard to do disjunctions. Uh, you know, to to do it in the way that I wanted to do it, but it's if we do a little bit of duplicate work, um, uh, it might make it a lot easier to, to include uh, disjunctions. Um, let me, yeah, all right, to, to, to add disjunctions. So, um, so what we probably want to do is to basically make an, a, a relatively simple implementation that is uh, that just works so that we can roll out this, this new evaluator uh, even if it, if it's at the expense of performance. But what I still expect is that the big O of that implementation will be better than the old implementation. So um, even though it's it's going to be far from optimal and, and doing some duplicate work, it will probably still be a lot faster than the old implementation. Um, Marcel, so just for the benefit of those listening who might not be with Fern merely with that notation, can you explain what you mean there by still significantly reducing the big O? Uh, yeah, so the time complexity, basically. So the, uh, reducing the time complexity of the algorithm. So, um, so there are some tricks that can that we can use to make uh, disjunctions uh, near linear. This is what we wanted to do uh, for this uh, zero point seven. Um, but right, you know, like an alternative is to just do a quadratic uh, or at least polynomial implementation. Um, you know, uh, which which is clearly not as good, uh, but it will be better than the current implementation, which is a performance bug, which is exponential, right? So that will be, uh, can greatly reduce the, the running speed. Um, and essentially what we'll be doing then, so there was a lot of optimizations that went in 0 0.3 versus 0 0.2. 
and a lot of people, um, uh, for a lot of people, things got faster. Uh, but this junctions was one of these things that got slower because of that bug. So essentially, we'll be mimicking then in the simple implementation, the 0 0.2 implementations of this junctions. Um, and of course, you know, by doing so, we, we do have the 0 0.7 platform then, which allows us to move to this new implementation down the line and, and improve all the, you know, get the linear um, uh, linear runtime for these junctions and stuff like that, or near I was linear. Just gonna I was just going to say, zooming back out for folks, if, rather than sort of uh, the detail of c time complexity, et cetera, that's really the whole purpose behind this th this refactoring the evaluator is to to actually enable these things, make them possible. You emphasize the point that the ease of fixes, but fundamentally it would have just been too great a piece of work to actually achieve those things with the quotes, the now old evaluator, if you like. Hence yeah. why we're doing this work in 0 0.7. Yeah. Yeah, so the layering that I discussed uh, last time really yep. uh, proves to be very useful. So, so if there is a bug, it's all very isolated. Um, I'm, you know, shaving also the model a little bit. So sometimes I'm even simplifying it, um, you know, at a, at a lower level. But but everything is very contained, so it's it's much easier to find bugs actually. Nice um, compared to the old uh, implementation. Great. Yeah. Um, if folks have any questions, feel free. We can sort of gather them at the end um, and easily come back to Marcel. Daniel, do you want to talk a bit about Unity briefly? Yep. And at the risk of just repeating myself for maybe the 10th time, um, we are doing quite big changes in 0 0.7 and 0 0.8. And we do have quite a lot of tests in our CI. And we also have Unity as part of the C of CI, which tests a bunch of third-party projects on the chain with the changes that we're making to Q on master on the default branch. Uh, so if you have a project that uses Q heavily and you're still not in this Unity CI corpus, please get in touch with me. You can use Slack, you can DM me on Twitter, anywhere else, or you can book some time with me uh, via that cal.com link. And then I'll walk you through um, what you can do to get added to Unity. But the, the key thing here is if you can do that before 0 0.7 and 0 0.8, then it's much less likely that we're going to break you. And the changes that are coming are pretty big. So it's not like we intend to break everybody, but if your project is large enough, unfortunately, it is somewhat likely that something will break. So you've been warned. Cool. Um, Rog, modules update. Oh uh, yeah, so we've been uh, we've been making some uh, good progress with modules. Uh, we actually had a uh, a week uh, last week where we spent, well, some of us spent some time together uh, working on that. Um, got a bunch of stuff landed. Um, so uh, we should in shortly have something that was um, that is actually a, a reasonably like some some sort of working thing um, which can actually be used. Although uh, whether we you know it will definitely all be experimental, um, and uh, I'm not sure whether we'll make. Uh, you know, if one pushes modules at that stage, it's it's a, a still an open question whether we'll actually um, keep pers keep them persistently. I guess um, we've been having some uh, feedback sessions, um, uh, which uh, which have uh, you know we've had some people coming along too, which has been nice. Uh, had some good discussions. Um, you can there's a link there and there's a recording of the call. So if you uh, want to uh, find a bit more detail, then please follow those links. Um, so there's a uh, yeah, bunch of things landed in Q line Q, and there's some some uh, back end stuff behind the scenes going on too. Um, there's some interesting uh, um, considerations around uh, because because we're using OCI registries as a back end now, and there are loads of different implementations. They all have their different quirks and nuances, and we clearly want to be compatible with those. So if there are uh, uh, specific implementations with um, with different restrictions on uh, names of repositories within the registry, for example, uh, or, or any other kind of quirks. Um, it would be good to hear about them. We're exploring, uh, you know, various. I mean, of course, they should all be standard because uh, because there is an OCI standard uh, for the for the um, for the API, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's as standard as all that. Um, and we need to, we want to be as compatible as possible so people can uh, serve their their own copies of Q modules from their own registry, wherever that might happen to be. Um, and um, as part of, you know, 
getting our own confidence in that things will actually work we'll have some end-to-end -end tests um, which of course we'll have our in unit tests and local tests as well but having some end-to-end -end tests to actually smoke test whether the whole thing works together is going to be uh, pretty important um, so when we've got think bootstrapped up to that stage you know we, we should have reasonable confidence that everything works into the future um, just, just briefly Rog um, on the relating those two previous points there of course different OCI backends having different nuances is something that's fairly easily then flushed out by having end-to-end -end tests that can be run agnostic of which backend you're using so that's another part of the plan for having those end-to-end -end tests is that they could theoretically be run against any OCI backend such that we could flip from say using Google container registry to GitHub container registry to anything Azure based or even a local process. And theoretically those tests should at that point, if they can, if we can connect everything together, all pass. Uh, and that's where we'll look to try and get some sort of confidence. Um, we will, however, be focusing on our initial deployment of the central registry um, and with the public private module split, I, we suspect it'll be that situation with the private modules um, where they are hosted on sort of any OCI repository that we'll see the, the most feedback from folks saying, hey, hang on a second, this is not compatible here. But if you go through to the, the discussion we had in last week's session, we have a plan at least sketched out of how we will sort of, I don't want to say mitigate those nuances, but help to sort of alleviate the pain of them in some way, shape or form. Yeah, I mean, hopefully it should. We're we're not we're not going beyond the bounds of of the of the spec much at all, really. Yeah. So so hopefully, hopefully it should just work for for everyone. But you never know. Um, you know, we've, we've, there's a bunch of new code here. So, um, and we have actually made our own uh, module to 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 do for for the OCA client to so that we can um, have less dependencies because the standard ones have all sorts of dependencies on lots of and we're, we're quite careful about our dependencies in the queue project um so and so we've actually got our, our own uh, oci uh github repo um which has has uh, our own implementation of the of the client uh, and also new memory server and things which is actually interesting from our point of view because there was no easy in memory oci server available anywhere really so um so it's actually super useful for us to run unit tests against too and hopefully in time it'll become useful for others as well it's not queue specific at all we should perhaps do a bit of a code walkthrough rog on one of the feedback sessions just to give people an idea of this the structure of how things are laid out yeah yeah it's, it's quite nice quite nice modular actually you can you can sort of plug things together in quite a pleasant uh, satisfactory way modular um, that was a good joke <laughs> Indeed. Sorry. um and uh so one one thing um one thing that we uh i will mention is that although uh you know this change to using oci um, back ends is um is something that's technically compatible with our v2 modules proposal we i think we'll and we'll actually end up calling the current one v3 because actually it has a load of updates um that make it actually a substantially different thing um and then it makes it easy to refer to as well um as, as you know something you know, this particular version uh next slide please um, so yeah, next steps we're yeah, continuing to land stuff in in the Q command. Uh, next steps are probably um, so I've got some CLs out for um, for supporting Q registry. But a, a big thing that you that is actually really important is a support for Q more tidy, um, so that you can actually get uh, the Q command to resolve your dependencies, update dependencies, um, all that sort of thing automatically. Um, uh, you don't want to be editing the module Q file um, directly. If anyone's familiar with, for those familiar with Go, um, you know, it's 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 super nice just to be able to run Go mod tidy and have everything updated um, as you as you like it, and and it would be really hard not to do that. So, um, so I think that's that's crucial, um, and and yeah, we'll um, we'll uh, we'll you know share our the the uh, the use cases and and add integration tests and there are there are ongoing discussions and feedback calls um please come along it would be it's always super useful to have everyone's discussions and feedback um and there is a calendar where there's a link so you can subscribe to those uh, 
those uh, those things, those calls. Um, yeah, it'd be lovely to see you there. Great. Thanks, Rog. Um, Aram, talking about WebAssembly. Uh, yeah, WebAssembly. So as previously mentioned, we want to use WebAssembly to give users the option of, of essentially writing their own code in whatever language they prefer and make that code available to queue. Uh, and uh, if you want more information about that, we, we had a WebAssembly session call uh, where we discussed this in more detail. So if you haven't seen that, you can, you can, you can watch the recording. Uh, we won't mention it here. Uh, yeah, so what we are doing now with WebAssembly, we, we have currently some support for WebAssembly modules, but uh, because there's no standardized way of passing data uh, back and forth between between the uh, WebAssembly host and, and the, the, the guest, essentially, uh, we only support uh, a, very, a very simple C ABI, basically. We can only pass integers and Booleans back and forth. So the main focus now is is to support richer data types, uh, roughly equivalent uh, in expressive power to JSON. So if you think that something can be encoded in JSON, it should be something that you you should be able to pass back or receive back from from WebAssembly. And by the way, don't don't uh, think too much about the JSON thing. We, we're using a binary encoding scheme that's not to do with JSON. Just in terms of of semantics, it, it should be roughly similar. Uh, so, so that's uh, the main focus now, and it will uh, be implemented to essentially a new ABI that will be designed to be uh, both forwards and backwards compatible. So we will be able to make changes and improve it in the future. Uh, at the same time, so you ba basically you'll be able to mix and match uh, uh, different versions of Q with with potentially old versions, uh, old compiled WASM modules or or uh, 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 new compiled as a module with, with an old version of Q. Uh, and there will be uh, uh, validations and checks in place that will uh, assure that this works only only if it makes sense, basically. So you wouldn't be, uh, so it's it's a safe thing to do. Uh, coincidentally, we're also using Q itself to make this this determination, which is interesting. Uh, so so that's the main focus. Uh, and and uh, as a first pass, we're going to support the uh, WASM code written in Go. Uh, as mentioned, WASM, you can use multiple languages uh, to the target. There are multiple languages to target WASM, but uh, uh, essentially because we're inventing a new uh, API and new encoding mechanism, essentially uh, there is to be language-specific code that that makes use of this so go will be the first target uh for that uh, uh think of something i mean it's not quite the same but think of like for example how grpc works in go uh, it's it's some binding thing that has to be generated at at, uh, at compile time uh so so go will be the first target but after that we will we will uh, expand the list of supported languages uh, rust is obviously uh, the uh, the next candidate and eventually in the future, we want to make this uh, uh, ergonomically easy for the user uh, because now essentially like you're on your own exactly how you compile the WASM and, uh, uh, you know, especially since we're, we're, we're uh, thinking of doing this uh, API thing, which implies even more tooling that you have to run manually and, and th stuff like that. So we want to abstract that away and, and make it super easy to use WASM with Q. Uh, regardless of whatever language you're using. So we're thinking maybe of doing something like QBuild or some other sort of uh, of tooling that that would make it uh, uh, easy for the for the user to to uh, make use of this, but we're not there yet. That's great. And just to join the dots with the conversation about modules, obviously, is that um, the ability to not not only write something in Go or Rust, for example, compile to WebAssembly, but then distribute that WebAssembly artifact blob call it what we want as part of a module is one of the key use cases what so whilst at the moment the, the web assembly and the the modules piece are entirely disconnected in terms of their development that's absolutely one of the goals is that we sort of bring those two bit back together again at, at such point in time when the modules is there and the web assembly stuff is there so for example, someone wanting to provide some 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 sort of hermetic deterministic uh, math functions could do so in Go, compile to WebAssembly artifact, distribute as part of a module, and then have other people depend on that as part of a, as part of their core Q evaluation. So that's where we're heading with this kind of stuff, um, and so that's where over the, the the course of the next few updates, we'll we'll be looking to join those dots again and bring the web assembly piece and the modules piece back together again. So just to complete that picture for folks. 
Cool, thanks, Aram. Um, uh, it's me next talking about alpha.qlang.org. Um, progress on alpha.qlang.org is, is going well. Um, we have, we've not flipped alpha.qlang.org to be the main site yet. Um, that's largely because we think we actually want to split some of the sort of more solutions oriented um, examples. Uh, and I'll talk about those in a second out from the main site. Uh, and so that just before we say go live and commit to having solutions oriented um, documentation on qlang.org for specific systems like GitHub Actions, et cetera, we're exploring actually doing that in a separate area, so a separate site, um, and keeping qlang.org a bit more um, uh, vanilla in that respect. So it is more just pure Q examples, still very practically oriented, still how to's and tutorials, but splitting those um, examples out to the side that are um, sort of targeting specific systems or solutions. Um, so alpha.qlang.org though is live, it is searchable. The, the search is easily going to be the most powerful aspect of um, the site when it goes live. We'll just be able to add new content. We'll also bubble up um, popular content, we'll bubble up popular search things so that people can start to more easily find content. And once they found a piece of content, navigate to other related pieces of content. Um, so that's we've got a um, decent amount of automation behind this because maintaining any of these docs by hand would, especially in the light of changes to the evaluator behind the scenes, uh, would be close to suicidal, I think, because we'd have to check everything by hand, um, which is not something that anybody wanted to take on. Uh, and with Q sort of being usable in lots of different uh, contexts, it's also our goal that we have lots of different bits of content that are perhaps quite repetitive in terms of what they're saying, but just tackling it from different perspectives. So where people come to it with a slightly different question, there's no harm in having a very similar piece of content to a piece of content that may already exist, but just answering it in a slightly different voice. And so to that end, we're going to have lots of bits of content that we really don't want to check by hand. And so that automation is pretty much done at this point, with the exception of the, the Go API, um, but that's just about to land this week. And so then we really can start ramping up on all those bits of content and then have complete confidence, even with changes in the evaluator, even as modules land, et cetera, as well. So that's the goal. Um, Q by example, as I've linked from here, is this idea to take the more solutions-oriented content and take it outside of qlang.org. We're currently experimenting with that in a GitHub repo where we just have markdown um, files that are there as a quick and easy way to actually spin up this content. This is not checked in the same way. So as it's marked here, it's more experimental. We're actually, there's less testing and assurance behind these bits of content. But the hope is, is that we'll actually start to spin up um, and have contributions for all different types of um, solutions oriented um, examples with Q. For example, we've got two that are going to land that are migrate, one of them being migrating to Porkbun and using Q to manage your uh, DNS records, for example, in that migration over to Porkbun. Um, and there, I th there will hopefully be plenty more. There's, there's a long list that I would like to write, and, but hopefully there'll be others that we can encourage folks to write as well. Um, so with that in mind, the next steps, um, we are just fleshing out a couple of front end bugs issues as we're um, kicking the tires a bit more in, in a bit more detail on the, the launch of qlang.org. Um, the first cut, as I said, of the Go API based docs learning this week, and then plenty more can follow after that because it'll be easily testable. Um, I'll start sharing previews of this content for feedback from folks um, via Slack, just as people start asking questions on Slack instead of responding in the Slack th thread with an answer and perhaps some example code, I'm actually going to start by replying, by writing a piece of content very quickly, perhaps just drafting it, publishing that draft to a CL, and then linking the draft into Slack and seeing how quickly we can get that feedback loop of question answer on alpha.qlang.org. That's the, that's the goal, really. Um, we, I don't know why this uh, doesn't say we're going to start the docs and contents course. It should do, uh, which will start next week. It, it's in the table at the end of this, um, at the end of the slides where we say what we've got um, in the calendar. Um, so we'll come to that in just a second. Um, so community updates, um, if you have any Q-based product, project, et cetera, you'd like to share, please just let us know. Um, details here on how to contact us. Um, GitHub Discussions is still um, a good way to do that. 
plenty of good discussions in Q Slack again. So thank you to everybody for contributing. I've had a busy couple of weeks, so I've been absent from there, but I know Daniel's been incredibly active and in replying from our side. So thanks to those who have uh, responded as well. Um, Aram, Marcel, do either of you want to talk about being at, I don't know, what is the name of the conference? Splash? Conflang? I don't know. I always get uh, the, the overarching, yeah, overarching conference is called Splash. Um, okay, yeah, it's all, all language uh, design related. So there's one track one day, October 24th. Uh, there's Conflang, which focuses on configuration languages. Uh, I'm on the uh, committee there, and I will also be speaking uh, at, at this uh, uh, at this track. Uh, but of course, you know, like um, yeah, so I'll be around uh, 22 to 26. Uh, Aram will be around, uh, I think, till the 27th or so, including. And then um, yeah, so if you happen to be around there, uh, come see us. Um, you know, it's a bit it's it's an academic conference. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, it's Oopslas there as well. So it's, it's like this conglomerate of all these language-related uh, language uh, conferences. Yeah, definitely, definitely click through to the SplashCon website there because it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a beast to navigate what's actually going on at the conference. And as you can tell, I confuse what the conference is actually called in one of the tracks. But, um, yep, so if anyone is going to be there, please just give us a shout either via Slack and so we can know um, to help try and schedule something if you'd like to meet up with Aram and Marcel. Um, oh, there is the docs and content call, great. Uh, I It's already in the community calendar. That's linked at the top for people who want to subscribe to that. Uh, we're having our, continue to have, excuse me, I'll try that again. We're continuing with our Q modules proposal feedback sessions. The next one is on the 12th. The conflang slash splash entry is in that table as well with the dates. Um, that's not actually in the community calendar. Um, Dominic, I think we might look to try and add that, especially Conflang into the community calendar so that folks can actually see that from a visibility perspective. That'd be great. Um, we don't have a date for the next community call, um, but if you do have any ideas, topics you'd like to see covered, reach out. Um, this Hopefully this format of giving a brief update followed by Q&A is still working for folks. Um, and if again, we'd uh, you'd like to sort of tweet us or blue sky us, if that's the right word, um the right verb to blue i don't know um uh so we'll, ex excess now right what's sorry isn't it, isn't it called x to what what's a tweet equivalent nowadays is it x oh i don't know I, I, I don't I, know either i was stuck on what the verb is to blue sky um yeah it's just a post on twitter x oh no <laughs> um uh I was hoping for something a bit more imaginative there, given blue sky. You'd have thought blue sky thinking they could have come up with something. Anyway, I'll stop. The pie, they call it pie. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, uh, cool. So q and I'll stop talking, which is probably a blessed relief for everybody. Uh, no more puns. I can't see whose hand that is yet, but please go Steve. back to whoever it is. Thanks. Hi. This question for our um, for the Wasm stuff. I know Paul mentioned the idea of uh, binding these. I, guess, uh, I don't know what to call them, uh, but where we compile the Wasm stuff modules um, to find yeah. them, like we find other Q modules. Um, is there anything different about the way that Q, that the Q binary will run in order to be able to move these things? You know, does it need containers or? special flags or something to tell it you know, how to, what to do with these things that it loads? Um, so by default, so so essentially uh, uh, by default, and this is what happens right now, the WebAssembly is, is loaded into a sandbox. Uh, and uh, the code there basically has access to nothing. Uh, it's, it's, it's purely self-contained. It has no access to the outside world. So it's safe to run in that sense. Uh, also, it means basically it cannot have any side effects, which is which is good. Uh, uh, in in, pr in, pr in principle, there's the sort of code you should be calling from Q. Uh, however, if you do want to have some code that, that has some side effects, uh, well, that's not supported yet. Uh, we will support it eventually, but it will not be by default. So it, there will be some sort of either, either flag or some explicit way of running Q that you have to do in order to get this behavior. 
by by default, it will always be uh, side effect free. Uh, however, all the details about how exactly this will work uh, are still in flux, especially on the design side. So we don't know exactly how this will work. Uh, there are also technical complications in the sense that uh, again, there's no real standard way of how you provide uh, access to the outside universe throughout the WASM ecosystem. There's language specific or project specific options, but there's no overarching standard standard. So that also needs some, some thinking. Uh, but again, by default, everything will be, we will be side effect free. That's a great question, Steve. It's actually one point we t talked on the other day when we were having a sort of a, a team catch up is uh, how to make the, uh, we call it the tooling layer at the moment. And I, that's probably going to have to change name because it um, ceases to to mean anything, or it's it's less meaningful in this in this new world. Um, is the most exciting? Your question is sort of one of the most exciting aspects of it for me because we can then rethink the way we do something like Q command, or the way that people do tools flow, <clears throat> which is really only useful when you can have code that can have side effects. Um, and so I think the most important thing is. The learning lessons and getting people to kick the tires on the WASM stuff with the core evaluator, getting the tooling in shape so that fundamentally we've got something that is usable that doesn't require about a million knobs to be twiddled and 20 pedals to be pushed before you can actually publish something. Um, and that'll help us to shape, as Aram was suggesting, what, what comes next after that. But the, the tooling layer is, um, let's just continue to call it the tooling layer for now until a better name comes along. That's, for me personally, at least, one of the most exciting aspects of that. So great question. Yeah, I saw so there's something. A, there's I a saw question something. on the Q&A. Uh, I'll, I'll answer that. Cool. Um, yeah, so the timeline for 0 0.7. So um, I think until these junctions are implemented, there, there's not much of a you know reason to release it because just a lot of Q will not work. Um, but what I could imagine is that we, um, so you saw this little pie chart where, where like 10% of the of the tests were not working. So if that gets down to like 1% or there's some, you know, a few esoteric uh, bugs left, uh, we could already start um, releasing it either as a, a 0 0.7 alpha or uh, even as a 0 0.6 release where it's not enabled by default. Um, because basically um, the new evaluator is, is uh, the way it's implemented right now is that the old and new evaluator are, are uh, present simultaneously. Uh, so it's, it's like, a, like a feature switch to use one evaluator or the other. Um, so even, you know, even if it's not uh, fully working yet, I can imagine that for a lot of people it would work a lot better already. Um, so, so you know, it, it, uh, yeah. So we hope to to release that. Uh, we hope to release something quite early. So on the grand scheme of things, definitely not days. Uh, that, that's absolutely not the case. It's a, it's a huge change. Um, so um, unfortunately, I had COVID, so I had a bit of a delay. But other than that, the anything but this junction things are are going quite quickly um as a fix but this junction is the big unknown so so if i have to give a rough guess uh, i i don't think anytime uh, sooner than a month but uh, hopefully within uh, within uh, two months we have uh, something might be sooner might be might be later so it's sort of sort of in that that order of magnitudes but uh, especially if it's useful we can we can uh, you know release a sort of a decrepit version earlier it's a great pleasure <clears throat> Excuse me, it's a great question, um, Pavel, and um, thanks for asking it. it. It is like a number one focus for us um, to to be getting these these changes in for what we're calling 0 0.7, as Marcel said, we might release it in, under a, a slightly different name. Um, because it unlocks all the performance stuff, because it unlocks so much ahead. Um, so yeah, we've rest assured we have got a, a super focus on it. Uh, and with Unity there, we're also increasing our confidence with the changes that we're making as well. So just to re-emphasize the point on Unity, the more stuff there is in Unity, the higher confidence we can have with all the changes that Marcel's making. So thank you to those who have registered with Unity. It is just providing that massive increase in confidence for us uh, as we're making these changes the more the merrier in unity sorry daniel i saw your hand up yeah. yeah to clarify something that marcel said about both evaluators existing in the same binary at once the thinking is that 
either 0 0.7 being opt out from the new evaluator or 0 0.6.1 being opt in, it would be something like an environment variable that you would use to, to flip back and forth. So it should be fairly easy, for example, if you want to upgrade to 0 0.7 and you run into a bug, it should be fairly easy for you to flip back to the old evaluator without rebuilding queue, without modifying your source code, and then just check or, or try different things. Cool, any other questions for folks? Might be turning. Oh, we do. We have uh, Vitali. Thank you. Yeah. Hey. Uh, hey. So thank you for your work. First of all, you have uh, done a great uh, thing. I, I didn't have time <laughs> uh, an option to express it. So uh, uh, my question is: uh, Yeah, you mentioned the um, um, the Unity uh, CI. Right. Uh, so uh, if we add our project uh, there, then it will be like uh, a base for you to, to test uh, some other cases. But uh, in case if uh, our project is uh, under NDA, we cannot uh, edit there like the, the whole project. So uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, what kind of projects do you expect there? Like some open source ones or like uh, small pet projects or... or uh, Sure, I, I can take that one um, if you like, Daniel. Just to, to cover off the, the sort of the legal aspect of that, there is a um, there is a company behind the the running of Unity. So we already have some private companies, uh, private code that is shared with us, and so in that respect, there is effectively a contract in place between two companies. So from a legal perspective, you're not interacting with just some random people on the internet. Um, so from that perspective, if you if that if you would like, to, there are people sharing private code with us now. Um, if you would like to explore that, we that would be great because again, it's it's often the code that you can't see on the internet that has these edge cases that are, that are the trickiest actually, and such is the case with Q as well. People have some really fantastically elaborate um, configurations that they're managing with Q, and that really helps to kick the tires on it. So. There is a company, uh, and so please don't feel like, oh, because this is private company code, we can't. We can explore that, and so please get in touch with Daniel. And sorry, Daniel, I'll, I'll hand yeah. over to you now yeah. on that. Yeah, so, so one, one comment. So the first Unity implementation was indeed public only, but the Unity yeah. we have now uh, supports private uh, repos with, uh, yeah. Mm. Okay, uh, and maybe if you're, well, when you're re ready to release the alpha version of uh, 0 0.7 or Six or whatever you call it. Yeah. Uh, maybe we'll just uh, try to implement it. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely try to implement it yeah. uh, in our pro project and maybe come back to you with some. Yes. So, so this is uh, this is a big thing, though. So um, at some point we have uh, thought about even uh, not doing that because if 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 you have uh, a change that you're making, of course the new evaluator is a big change. But especially if you're making uh, changes to the language. And you verified against all Unity. If if somebody then later uh, upgrades and finds this problem, it's way too late to to to. It, it, it's mm -hmm. way more effort, right, to to fix that uh, by hindsight. So uh, we do at some point want to give priority to people that have uh, Unity, right, and, and and not just reactively uh, respond to to uh, yeah things that we've broken, right. If it could have been avoided, so that that's that's one caveat there. Okay. It's, it, it helps us a lot to to know it immediately, right? As we're checking in the, as we're updating our code that we know we're going to break. And just briefly, by us there, that means everyone who uses Q, because it's not just those people maintaining Q. It's just everyone who uses crew, Q, not crew. Everyone who uses Q has sort of that derivative benefit of these things being caught early not being released as bugs, et cetera. So that's the value that Unity is effectively providing to the community in that situation. And that's how, we, that's how we're driving it. Sorry, Daniel, I beg your pardon. Uh, to give a bit more, well, almost everything has been said, but to give a bit more clarity on why uh, adding your project early is better uh, is because um, the way Unity CI works, well, the way RCI works, including Unity, is on CLs, right? So when Marcel starts his big, long chain of changes for 0 
and um, he needs to decide whether, for example, his choice of the disjunction algorithm is right or not, um, he will get an answer from CI, right? It's going to be either red or green. And if you decide to add your project after the first alpha, those sort of design decisions will all have been made and implemented already. So it's a bit what Paul said about um, you testing the alphas and betas or the final releases or adding yourself to Unity later is still definitely better than nothing. Uh, but it might be if you tell us, oh, this breaks us when we're already at the first beta, for example, it might be that we're already like in mid-December and we don't want to delay the release any further, right? So it's always a bit of a tricky choice for us. Whereas if you tell us early, it's easier. Yeah, I understand. Uh, just the thing that uh, queue uh, configuration is really tightly uh, intercommunicated with our system and uh, it's sure. not that easy just to export it. It won't work in your system just, just like that because we use the uh, Go implementation of uh, Cure Evaluator. Mm -hmm. We um, add some values and stuff. So uh, if yep. you just export the, the queue, it won't work. So I think we'll just uh, probably uh, think of some uh, smaller example of our configuration to make it public and uh, post it to the that, that's certainly one option, but please, um, Vitaly, feel free to contact Daniel and just set up some quick time to kick ideas around. We have, for example, um, one company that uh, um, does something very elaborate where they sort of do like an export and obfuscate the export. So it, it's entirely muddied as to what's what the configuration is because all the names are, are rubbish. Now, in general, that's an incredibly hard problem uh, to uh, generally obfuscate something, but in that situation, they knew how to obfuscate what they were exporting. So it made it sort of like a nice reproducible thing. Mm. So there are plenty of ideas, but setting up some time with Daniel to kick those ideas around, uh, please feel free to do that. Uh, Daniel's um, got all the, the background on Unity, plus plenty of good ideas on how to, to either make things public or to, to to export like a limited version in a private way, we we already have a number of yeah. these. Uh, and uh, and Daniel, I, I don't know. Do we? Um, so what's the status of the Go tests reports? Because it's not just uh, running Q, right? Like it's, it's also being able to run uh, Go tests. Um, so I don't want to talk for too long because we've already been spending quite a bit of time on this question. But yeah. to summarize, we do support uh, running a specific version of Q via either the Q tool itself or by inserting it in your Go mod for a Go project. So we do support running Go test. Uh, the only tricky bit with Go test is that some Go tests are quite slow or have heavy dependencies. So it's going to be more on a case-by-case -case basis. Whereas, for example, running Q export, bar barring the performance issues with 0 0.6 and 0 0.5, running Q is generally cheap, right? So that's usually not a problem, whereas Go test is more open-ended. Okay. So case-by-case -case basis, but yes. Thank you. Great question. Thank you. Anybody have anything else? Otherwise, please feel free to follow up. I will just get a quick link to the, the GitHub discussion. Um, and we can follow up with any questions that folks might have there. Oh, I'm being very slow at getting the, here we go. Um, otherwise, thank you very much everyone for joining today. Um, oh, oh, just a, a question, just the last minute there, brilliantly timed. <laughs> um, are you planning to improve some language based constructs? Um, ah, like introducing functions. functions. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. So, so uh, <laughs> So functions, well, yes and no, right? Like the, the WASM part is, is uh, basically functions. Um, um, yes, yeah, so, so one of the experience we have with configuration languages, and, and, and this is a standard pattern of evolution that you see over and over and over again, and it always ends in, in tears and mayhem and, and disaster, right? Like where you do not want to, you really do not want to mix code with, um, um, uh, with configuration so the idea is basically uh you know coming from this spreadsheet land basically where your your, your spreadsheet uh, formula should be easy right and if you have any code you should write it in some other language that you can call from from within right that's the whole uh wasn't idea and that's where we want to go 
Um, of course, you can emulate functions with uh, uh, with structs and stuff like that. Uh, but but yeah, we really don't want to go there with with Q. Ideally, we just r rather provide a, a platform independent way of of calling uh, functions. Um, that said, we do want to be able to provide uh, define uh, function signatures in Q, which has a lot of benefits. It's, it's, uh, but but that's a that's a separate uh, that's a separate story. Uh, that's what Paul alludes to, I think, here with the Q function notation. But that's that's not actual. Uh, or is this uh, the struct calling thing, Paul, that you're referring to? It is. Yeah. yeah, that's that's the top of the B. So it's the proposal we stuck at the top of the core built-in extensions in terms yeah. of the syntactic suggestion on how we yeah. do that. Yeah, that would be the only exception, but nothing like uh, you know, uh, like recurrent functions or or anything anything like that. That's that's just really uh, something that doesn't belong in Q. Uh, we if, I, if I can add, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. if I can um. add to that, is uh, obviously functions. Uh, people want to write functions, and functions are very useful. And uh, I, I just briefly mentioned this, but the whole point of having some or something in a twin layer like QBuild is to make it actually really easy for people to write these functions in some other language. Because yeah, people, now nowadays you can do the struct trick, uh, the one that Paul mentioned, and, and stuff like that. But it's you know it's it's complicated and it's not great. Uh, uh, and I, I think that people would be generally pretty ha uh, happy with uh, the writing functions in their language of choice, as long as it's super easy to integrate back into Q and like the workflow is super easy. Uh, that's why we really want to concentrate on, on making the tooling there work. No, in our case, we use uh, templates like functions and uh, pass arguments to dash uh, somebody. Uh, and uh, it looks like more chatty. Mm -hmm. uh, dash name, double dot type, and uh, something uh, bottom. Let alias set this uh, input argument. And uh, next, pass uh, this uh, and other functions with the uh, argument with the same name. Uh, mm -hmm. From this let, uh, we can't use uh, original uh, input argument because it's uh, has uh, same scope as uh, uh, calling argument, and uh, we can't uh, set uh, uh, the res result of uh, ex no, result of this function to direct object. Uh, we need to set. Uh, to some substructure uh, because we has a loop mm. uh, with uh, arguments and uh, we can't pass uh, directly uh, scalar uh, scalar list and uh, mm, uh, so it's more chatty construction as a result yeah, I think this is one of the things which, as we start to make progress on the WebAssembly side of things, um, and as well as we make progress on 943, um, I think it's going to be a case, Artem, of just looking at the progress we make with the WebAssembly stuff and 943. <clears throat> as Marcel suggested, there's that syntactic construction, which if you look in um, 943, um, and I sort of linked there under the heading of the Q function notation, um, that might well make it easier from you from a calling perspective. I think, as you're pointing out, though, from the quotes, the implementer perspective of such functions in Q, it's not quite so pretty. So I think what we're going to need to do is once we've made some progress with the WASM side of things, once we've made the calling of these Q quotes functions cleaner, then I think we should stand back and say, well, what do we have? We've got the WebAssembly side where um, these things can be implemented in other languages, as Ram said, with good tooling to support it. We've got the nice calling notation for that for those things you choose to implement in Q, if you like, if that lands. We then, I think, need to see what what what's left at that point and make a judgment call on what we should therefore do to to, to improve things or not. Um, because otherwise, we sort of we have a few too many plates spinning. Would be would be my thought. Um, the WebAssembly stuff is coming along nicely um, to the point that actually we'll be able to kick the tires on that in relatively relatively short order in, in sort of the grand scheme of things. 
um, and 0 0.7 since that main call is implement some uh, imperative functions. Um, Basically. Uh... Yeah. And so maybe I'm misunderstanding the example that you provided here then. Uh, as I understand, the group assembly allow write function functions and uh, other and any code in uh, other language like Rust, Go, uh, um, JavaScript, something else. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a declarative function. No, for example, I need to calculate SK hash from string. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, in uh, our case, we have a template, something ah. like XSLT. Uh, so we have input arguments, uh, Q structure, and this uh, Q structure pass this uh, input arguments to uh, some position, no, templating, basic, no, basic templating. And yep. uh, for example, uh, XML uh, has a XSLT language, mm -hmm. and uh, this language uh, allow make any transformation with uh, mm. XML. And uh, YAML JSON lock. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, if I understand, yes. Yeah, so, so the the difficulty is that you want to create not let's say JSON mm. values as a result of a function, but you really want to create uh, Q templates, basically like transform uh, data. Mm. So, so we do have, uh, um, so as language base constructs, we do have this, uh, which is a separate uh, issue, like this query extension um, of a language, which, which would allow you, uh, you know, give you sort of XML path or JSON path or whatever, uh, like powers of transforming structures, which would be working at, at, the, at the Q level, which is, uh, Different from functions, but maybe that is something what would uh, get more in the direction of what you're referring to. Uh, no, I am not templates. It's uh, too many small templates which can get the uh, same arguments uh, only as input. Uh, mm -hmm. But this uh, arguments is uh, uh, moving from one variable to to another variable. What? Because uh, I have not uh, uh, name convention. Uh, all uh, uh, argument, input arguments and output arguments uh, differ uh, differ only by name conventions. And mm -hmm. uh, I need to put uh, input arguments to let variable and uh, let variable to input arguments of uh, an another template. Uh, we. Uh, only because I can't pass it directly. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so let's uh, do what uh, what what uh, Daniel suggests uh, and and start a separate uh, Slack with concrete examples, and then see if we uh, can come to a solution there. Super happy to help with that, Artem. Um, if whichever is easier for you, Slack or GitHub discussions, um, please just let us know either way. Um, just with by raising a GitHub discussion or pinging us on Slack, and we're happy to just try and work out where which issue covers what it is you're talking about, or if it's not covered by any existing issue, very happy to explore what um, the, the right solution might there, there might be. Does that work for you, Arkan? Uh. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, because the we're running out. Issue 9043 is uh, really. Uh, no, it's the same, it looks like. Okay, but we're, we're super happy to follow. It's just that we're coming to time on the call now. We're very happy to follow up afterwards. Um, so, whether if you want to message us on Slack uh, and we uh, or, or on a GitHub discussion, we can happily set up time as, as, as we need to as well. Um, Tony, if you had time for we have time for one quick question, if you want to sneak it in. 
Sure. Yeah. Just wondering if there's any updates on like things like LSP and other language oh, tools that need to be in the ecosystem. Thank you. I forgot to include a slide on that. Um, the as the work on qlang.org is, I don't want to say coming to an end because I don't think the documentation piece will ever come and come to an end. But at least part of it is sort of shifting into a different phase. I am going to be starting the long promised um, first commits on the LSP. Um, Tony, you and I have exchanged a few messages on that. Um, and what I'll be doing is sharing updates as I originally promised in um, GitHub issues, but also in Slack as well. So as I've started to do a bit more of a train of thought on the qlang.org stuff and the docs and contents channel on Slack, I'll do the same on the LSP as well. Um, would be delighted for others who have experience on the LSP side of things, or for anyone who would just like to to, to learn and be part of the journey on the LSP side for others to join as well. Um, I might even sort of inspired a bit by Tony's live streaming sessions, actually try a bit of that, um, where do some thinking through of this stuff um, live as well. Cool. We are perfectly on time. Um, if anybody has any other questions, please do follow up in issue 2613. Um, otherwise, we look forward to speaking to you next time.